Today, we're going to be talking about liquid states and surfactants. And I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, liquid state and surfactants. As we address the topic of liquid states, we're primarily going to routinely and repeatedly refer to water. Obviously, there are many liquid states of many materials, but because of the universal presence of water, all over the planet, and because water is the, uh, the primary constituent in all life forms, we we'll largely reference water as we talk about the states of liquids. Water is so important. Uh, there, it cannot be emphasized enough. Uh, we humans on our planet have a very distinct and existential relationship with the available fresh water supplies on the planet. Understanding that relationship is paramount. Fresh water is necessary for the survival of all living organisms on earth. Our bodies are made up of about 60% water and we cannot survive more than a few days without it. <clears throat> water is a precious substance that meets our physical needs while at the same time being of great spiritual importance to many people. Water is also an integral part of many ecosystems that support us and a myriad of other species. <clears throat> water is a liquid. It's held together. The H2O molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds are a very instrumental uh, electrochemical component that dictates and defines uh, in chemistry the dynamics of water as a liquid. Water is also the universal solvent. Water dissolves more substances than any other liquid. The bent molecule shape makes it polar. It gives the oxygen atom a partial positive charge and the hydrogen atoms partial positive charges. The partial charges attract parts of polar molecules to dissolve them. Water does not dissolve non-polar molecules like oil. Now let's go more fundamentally into a discussion about the states of a liquid. A liquid, by definition, takes the shape of any container. A liquid assumes the shape of the part of the container which it occupies. Particles can move and slide past one another. Not easily compressible. There's little free space between the particles. You cannot, read, you cannot compress liquids so that they occupy a smaller volume. It flows easily. Particles can move and slide past one another. Properties of the liquid state. Only liquids combine the ability to flow and the effects of strong intermolecular forces. What is an intermolecular force? It is forces that exist 
within the molecule itself, the liquid molecules. These are called intermolecular forces. And these intermolecular forces are important components of a liquid that influence its behavior. Science understands this state least at the molecular level. So this is an admission that there's a lot still to be discovered in the world of science. Science is a process of discovery. Uh, it is not a collection of absolute knowledge. It is knowledge that is evolving and will continue to evolve over time. Our understanding of the dynamics of the electrochemistries at the molecular level within a molecule is still an area of science which needs more investigation and discovery. Because of the random arrangement of the particles in a gas, any region of the sample is virtually identical to any other. Different regions of a crystalline solid are identical because of the orderly arrangement of the particles. You know, we've already discussed in a previous session the differences between liquids, gases, and solids. This, these points here are highlighting that information. Liquids, however, have regions that are orderly one moment and random the next. This gives rise to a certain complexity. Despite this complexity, many macroscopic properties such as surface tension, capillarity, and viscosity are well understood. And we're going to discuss these properties of a liquid in our session today. Again, to highlight the differences between a solid, a liquid, and a gas, in the case of a solid, the particles are close together and they are arranged in an orderly fashion. A liquid, the particles are still relatively close together, but their behavior is more disorderly. In a gas, the particles are far apart. This, for example, if we were talking about water, we would be talking about water vapor. And the arrangement of the particles is completely random. Now let's begin to introduce these properties of liquids. First, we will focus on surface tension. The intermolecular forces, which we have described briefly already, the intermolecular forces have different effects on a molecule at the surface compared with ones in the interior. Now, what do we mean by that? And we're, you will notice that we explain some of these points from different angles. It may seem like we're repeating ourselves, but really we're just taking different angles to explain the same information. In the case of these intermolecular forces, as it relates to a liquid, this is the molecules of the liquid that are internal to the body of the liquid. These are the molecules of the liquid that can be found at the surface of the liquid. And there is an interaction between these molecules at the surface and the intermolecular forces within these molecules is concentrated on its relationship with its fellow molecule to its left or its right. Whereas, the molecule on the inside, its intermolecular forces are distributed more broadly and the attraction between these will be weaker. An interior molecule is attracted by others on all sides. So this is an example of that. It's an inter this is a molecule 
interior to the liquid. And you can see that it's intermolecular attractions uh, from one molecule to the other is in all directions, multi-directional. A surface molecule is only attracted by others below and to the sides. So it experiences a net attraction downward. And this is an important consideration that helps explain the behavior of a liquid uh, in that it has a surface area. We pointed that out in a previous discussion about liquids is they always have a surface area. And this surface area based on the molecular intermolecular forces in the case of the surface of the liquid these forces are concentrated to the sides and downward not outward it makes the water at the surface these molecules at the surface it's as if they're being pulled to the, by the force from each side of it and the forces internal to it within the liquid. To increase attractions and become more stable, a surface molecule tends to move into the interior. This is the illustration of that. For this reason, a liquid surface has the fewest molecules and thus the smallest area possible. In effect, the surface behaves like a taut skin covering the interior. Because of the extraordinary intermolecular forces between these surface molecules of the water or the liquid, you have an extraordinary force uh, right at the surface between those unique molecules at the surface and they create for the liquid as a whole, and an intermolecular force skin. And this we call surface tension. So in this illustration, this is water. It is the liquid. This is a needle floating on the liquid. <clears throat> the needle is subject to gravity. There is a skin that we have described now as a relationship between the particles of water, particles of the liquid, in this case, H2O is the molecule. So the particles of the liquid are H2O molecules. And there is a mathematical uh, relationship between the force of gravity and the surface tension at this between the molecule which is created between the molecules of H2O, in this case water, that's found at the surface of the liquid. So here's an illustration of that in a bit more detail. The atoms on the surface are attracted to one side. So you can see this attraction between them and they are attracted downward. Whereas the, the atoms interior to the liquid are attracted to each other and the connectivity from one, one molecule to another is actually weaker than the connectivity of the molecules which are existing at the surface of the liquid and the molecule, the connectivity between the molecules at the surface of the liquid. The only way to increase the surface area is for molecules to move up by breaking attractions in the interior, which requires energy. So this, <clears throat> now we're talking about breaking surface tension. How do you do that? The only way that can be done <clears throat> is by injecting energy into the system. And in this case, the system is the liquid. Surface tension is the energy required 
to increase the surface area. In general, the stronger the forces are between particles, the more energy it takes to increase the surface area. So the greater the surface tension. So in, when we say the stronger forces are between particles, this is simply suggesting that there is a difference in the strength between the particles, the molecules in different liquids, okay? And so different liquids will have a relative different surface tension. The illustration here is one of evaporation. And in this case, water has a very high surface tension it takes energy to break the hydrogen bonds on a water molecule at the surface in order to observe and produce evaporation. What can enhance evaporation from the surface of the water? When temperatures are, in, when temperatures are increased, molecules move faster. They gain energy. So this is, in this case, it is the delivery of heat energy, which is, which is transferred into the molecules of water. That energy then becomes chemical energy, okay? And this, this increase in temperature makes the molecules move faster, associated with gaining energy and can break the surface tension more easily. Wind also, wind also enhances evaporation. Water has a high surface tension because of hydrogen bonds between the molecules of H2O. Hydrogen to oxygen, hydrogen to oxygen, hydrogen to oxygen, and these bonds are called hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds are a unique property in a liquid that is based on H2O molecule. <clears throat> now we're gonna to shift to another property of a liquid. It's called capillary action. And capillary action by definition is quite simple. It's the rising of a liquid against the pull of gravity through a narrow space, such as a tube, a glass tube. It could be a biological vascular system. Capillarity results from the competition between the intermolecular forces within the liquid which are called cohesive forces, and those between the liquid and the tube walls. And that force is called an adhesive force. So the difference between cohesion and adhesion produces capillary action. A little bit more about cohesion and adhesion. Force developed between molecules of the same material is called cohesive force. Force developed between molecules of different material is called adhesive force. And force, we should remember, is an electrochemical phenomenon. The, the, the hydrogen bonds are an example of that. Okay, so coming back to the illustration here, cohesion, two like materials. Adhesion, two materials that are not the same. In this illustration of a tube or a vascular system, uh, we have example of adhesion on both sides, which in this case, we're looking at perhaps water. <laughs> And these H2O molecules will adhere to the sides of the tube, okay? So this adherence to the side of the tube is based on an adhesive force. In the case of the middle, 
what controls this, this, this force is cohesive, which means it is a connectivity or relationship, an electrochemical re interaction between the actual molecules of water itself. So one molecule to another molecule to another molecule to another molecule. That internal dynamic in the liquid we refer to as cohesion. Capillary action, adhesive forces initially cause a steep meniscus. Okay, this is the meniscus right here. So this is a concave observation of the liquid. At the surface of the liquid, an actual concave formation appears. Okay, so adhesive forces initially cause a steep meniscus which an adhesive force or the H2O molecules, in this case, we're talking about water. Uh, we're talking about the adhesive forces that are the H2O molecule attaching itself to the sides of the tube. And that initiates a process that we call capillary action or capillarity. Cohesive forces respond by trying to minimize the surface area of the meniscus and the water level rises, okay? So the cohesive forces between the H2 molecules tries to minimize the surface area. And as we talked before, the dynamics of surface tension, the skin at the top of the liquid, the forces within the liquid, relative to producing surface tension, always attempt to minimize that surface tension. It's the nature of that force, easy force. Adhesive forces, adhesive forces then cause another steep meniscus. It continues to climb, climb, climb. So as the cohesive forces compensate for the adhesive activation, the connectivity, climbing of the wall. Adhesive forces also correspond by again, adding on additional force of adhesion. Cohesive forces then cause the meniscus to be filled in. This is a cycle. Uh, it's a linear process. The cycle repeats itself until the upward adhesive force equals the weight of the raised water in the tube. So it's a relationship between the force of adhesion, the H2 molecules against the side of the tube, relative to the weight of the raised water in the tube, which is a relationship with gravity. Now let's look at nonpolar. We're going to simply make a brief reference to nonpolar surfaces. And it will come up again later when we talk about the use of it, managing, the usefulness of managing these properties in agriculture. The adhesive forces between water and a nonpolar surface are much weaker than the cohesive hydrogen bond forces within water. Water will then pull away from a nonpolar surface and form beaded droplets. Water beading on the waxy surface, a nonpolar surface, uh, is an example of this. In this case, we see a leaf. It has a waxy surface or a, 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 an oily surface. And in this case, that the chemistry of that oil and the wax is nonpolar by nature. Whereas the, the molecule of water, a bent molecule, based on the hydrogen bonds that hold it together, is a polar molecule. And, and what we see happening here is, is a reaction between the nonpolar chemistry of the wax on the surface of the leaf, the 
polar behavior of the molecules in the water. And the polar behavior of the molecules in water driven by hydrogen bonds is a force that is greater than the attraction of the molecules to a nonpolar surface or nonpolar molecules, the waxy molecules on the surface of the leaf. Now we're going to shift to another property in liquids, which is called viscosity. Viscosity is the resistance of a fluid to flow. And it results from intermolecular attractions that impede the movement of molecules around and past each other. So in this illustration, we have the a demonstration of pouring water versus pouring honey. And we've all seen that, we know what that looks like. And what we're looking at when we notice the difference between these two things is the viscosity of the liquid. Viscosity is the measurement of a fluid's internal resistance to flow. This is typically designated in units of centipose or posy, but can be expressed in other acceptable measurements as well. Some conversion factors are as follows. 100 centipose equals one pose. Centipose equals one MPA, millipascal second. Okay, the, 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 the mathematics here are not super important in our presentation today, but it is important for you to recognize that viscosity is a measured phenomenon. One posy is the viscosity of a fluid that requires a shearing force of one dime, a measurement of force, to move a square centimeter area of two parallel layers of fluid one centimeter apart with a velocity of one centimeter per second relative to the other layer the space between the layers being filled with fluid. Sounds a little bit abstract, but it is a description of measuring the movement of liquids or viscosity. Some viscosities as measured, the viscosity of air, obviously a gas, it has behaviors similar to a fluid. Gases can be moved, but their viscosity is very, very low. Very, very, very little resistance movement between the particles. Acetone is a very fluid liquid, meaning that it can pour very easily. Methanol, water is the most universal fluid that we are all familiar with, and it is designated 1.0. So you could think of water as a liquid and its measurements as sort of the foundation to all other fluids. So as you can see, it is given the basic number of one, and there are fluids, there are liquids, that have viscosities less than, and there are viscosities, <clears throat> there are liquids that have viscosities greater than water. So we have ethanol, olive oil, motor oil, maple syrup, honey, molasses. Molasses is uh, made from cane sugar, and it is a very dense material that pours very slowly. There are forces or factors that influence viscosity. One of them is temperature. So relative cold to hot, the temperature of the liquid from zero degrees centigrade in this example, 40 degrees, 100 degrees centigrade. In this case, no flow because the liquid is basically functioning almost like a solid. 
high flow at 100 degrees centigrade. The greater the temperature, the less viscosity. Viscosity versus temperature. Temperature in centigrade, viscosity in POSI from zero to 600. And at, at uh, very low temperatures, you can see in this illustration, the liquid having a very high viscosity. Whereas as the temperature goes up, the viscosity uh, decreases down in this range. And it's quite a marked contrast actually. Temperature has a big influence on viscosity. Viscosity and temperature, low viscosity versus high viscosity. A fluid with high viscosity resists motion. Temperature can affect viscosity of many, many types of liquids. The energy of increased thermal motion is enough to overcome the forces that bind the molecules together. So temperature actually, the energy that is conveyed to the liquid in the form of heat energy overcomes the internal forces that are connecting the molecules together in the liquid. And as such, the molecules in the liquid become more fluid. They, you could say, are energized. They have absorbed heat energy and that has been absorbed or transferred or converted into chemical energy. The illustration here is, here is without the heat, by adding heat, we have these more fluid relationships with less bonding between the molecules, less bonding between the molecules. Other substances whose viscosity is impacted by temperature include a wide range of fuels, including aviation fuels, marine fuels, and oils of different types. Viscosity and molecular shape. This is a very interesting component of observing and understanding the dynamics of viscosity. So molecules themselves have different shapes. Here's an illustration. Water, benzene ring, ethanol, more of a linear molecule. Here's a very blocky molecule, which is glycerol. So you can see quite distinct shapes here to the molecules. This is how they're structured. This is what they would look like if you could see the molecules. Small spher spherical molecules make little contact and pour easily, like buckshot from a bowl. Now buckshot are small round structures. Uh, macroscopically, you would see them as small round structures, like the, the, there are some kinds described as buckshot. But any small round structures pour more easily from a bowl uh, because there is simply less resistance. Spherical molecules make little contact and pour easily. Long molecules make more contact and become entangled with each other. As a result, they pour more slowly like cooked spaghetti from a bowl. Liquids consisting of longer molecules have higher viscosities. Now we're going to play a short video here, which illustrates some of these points, comments on some of these same points, repeating some of what I have said, but from a slightly different angle. Okay. Surface tension, viscosity, and capillary action. In this video, we will be describing these three concepts. 
These concepts are main applicability tends to be in biology and physics classes. However, the underlying principles to these are intermolecular forces. It's important to talk about them here in this context of a chemistry class so that you can better understand them in your biology and physics context where the topics are more often used. Surface tension happens because intermolecular forces of molecules at the surface are using more of its attractive forces to attract less molecules. This creates more tension at the surfaces of substances than within them. So things like water bugs can use this to skate across the water, so long as their mass is spread out over a large enough surface area. You can see that this might be why the water bugs have a very large portion of their legs on the water. Of course, molecules that have higher intermolecular forces will also have higher surface tension, given the stronger attractions. In the figure here, I've tried to diagram how this would work. If you look at the top molecule, it's using all of its intermolecular forces to attract three molecules. Meanwhile, a molecule that's further into the surface is using its, its intermolecular forces to attract six different atoms or molecules. So this means that at the surface there is more tension or the molecules are being held together tighter. Viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to flow. Since we are pretty adapted to think of water as free flowing, I use this as my example as a, of a low viscosity liquid. But actually, in comparison to a lot of things, it too is pretty high. However, let's compare it to something like honey. Honey is definitely a liquid at room temperature. It flows to the shape of its container and has a defined volume. However, it flows very, very slowly in comparison to something like water. This is because it is what we call viscous. The more intermolecular forces that a liquid has, the more that the molecules are held together, and so the higher the viscosity and the less free-flowing it is. Temperature also impacts this. If you increase the temperature of a substance, it will lose viscosity. It will flow easier. And you know this if you've ever heated up, tea for, heated up honey for tea because it gets more runny as you warm it up. Now our last one, capillary action. Capillary action is a bit more complicated than the other two. There are actually two competing forces that lead to the capillary action. The first involves the intermolecular forces within the liquid. These are called cohesive forces and hold the liquid together. The second is the intermolecular forces between the liquid and the walls of the tube that the liquid is in. These are called adhesive forces. So if you put a water, or excuse me, if you put liquid inside a tube, it may or may not flow up the tube. And the amount that it flows up the tube is different based on the substance. If cohesive forces dominate, or in other words, the forces that are holding the liquid to itself dominate, then there is very little capillary action. However, if adhesive forces dominate, or in other words, the interactions between the walls and the liquid dominate, then there is a lot of capillary action. For a quick review, liquids tend to attract each other, minimizing surface area. The higher that you, the IMFs are, the higher the surface tension is. Viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to flow. The higher the IMFs, the higher the viscosity. Capillary action is the ability of a liquid to flow against gravity in a narrow tube. If you have higher cohesive than adhesive forces, then you will not have as much capillary action. Meanwhile, if you have higher adhesive forces and lower cohesive forces, then you will get more capillary action. Okay, now we're going to shift again. This Now we're going to talk about surfactants. Uh, this is a different topic and it is going to present the 
role of surfactants, the chemistry of a surfactant, and, and the interaction of surfactants with different types of liquids. Surfactants are used largely to connect uh, polar substances with nonpolar substances. Surfactants are substances that absorb the surfaces or interfaces, causing a marked decrease in the surface tension. Or a molecule, a surfactant is a molecule. It's a molecule that contains a polar portion and a nonpolar portion. It's called surface active agent or a surfactant. So there is a polar component to the molecule and a nonpolar component to a surfactant molecule. In this illustration, we have water and we have an oil drop. And what happens is an interactive process where this being the surfactant molecule, it has a part that uh, likes water and a part that likes oil. So in this case, you see this part of the molecule interacting with the oil droplet. This part of the molecule is interacting with the water. And as such, the water droplets, or excuse me, the oil droplets will then be suspended in the water itself and they are not floating to the surface. This is another illustration of these, of these surfactant molecules. Here is an example of it. The yellow portion is connecting to this oily material that you see here. And the black stuff represents a, a, a nonpolar molecule or oil material. And the surfactant is useful in that it, the, the side of the molecule that connects to the oil picks up the oil and breaks it up into little component parts like this, surrounded by the surfactant. Okay. And so this is actually what happens when you use soap on your skin. Uh, the surfactants allow the, soap is a surfactant. The molecules in soap that are surfactants actually connect, one side of that molecule connects to the oil on the surface of your body. The other side of that molecule is connected to the water that comes from the shower. And when you bring these things together, because you have now introduced the interaction of the surfactant with the, which is the soap, with the oil on your body, it is possible then to freely wash the oils from your surface of your body. So soap itself does not actually do the cleaning. It just creates a chemical reaction that becomes possible between water and the oil. It's the intermediary chemistry. Surface tension and water evaporation in plants. This is another subject for us. What is responsible for surface tension of water? The evaporation of water from the surfaces of mesophyll cells causes the air water interface to retreat into the cellulose matrix of the plant cell wall because the cohesive forces between water molecules are stronger than their attraction to air. What does this look like? Okay, co cohesion keeps molecules of the same substance together. For plants, you know, all of these things that we grow in agriculture to produce food, feed, and fiber. These in plants, cohesion keeps the water molecules together. Surface tension is responsible for the shape of water drops and for holding the structures together 
as plants soak up the water. The cohesion tension theory of water transport in a plant. The driving force is evaporation. Evaporation is a force. There is another force, which is cohesion in the xylem of the plant, which is the vascular system of the plant. And the xylem is that part of the vascular system where materials like water move from the soil up into the plant. Water uptake from the soil by the roots moves up through the xylem. The force that pulls it up is evaporation at the surface of the leaf. Water capillary action in plants. Capillary action helps bring water up into the roots. We've discussed capillary action and the dynamics of capillary action and the interplay between adhesive forces and cohesive forces, which produce capillarity or capillary action. But capillary action can only pull water up a small distance, after which it cannot overcome gravity. To get water up to all the branches and leaves, the forces of adhesion and cohesion go to work in the plant xylem to move water to the furthest leaf. And to a large extent, as you move into the various branches of the plant and then to the veins or arteries of the leaf, this vascular system becomes progressively more small compared to the xylem itself, which is in, internal to the stem of the plant. So this, as the tubes change in size or the vascular system changes in size, the capacity of adhesion and cohesion to combat the forces of gravity against the water actually perform more efficiently because the tubes become progressively smaller as you move from the xylem, the stem of the plant, out through all the way to the very tips of the leaf. Water transpiration, this capillarity we call it, is water absorbed by the roots. There is like a suction pressure, which is called, which is produced by water loss by transpiration. So this is a form of water loss, transpiration, which is the evaporation of water where water moves from a liquid state here to a gas state in the atmosphere, this whole process of moving water from the roots to a gas state through, through the stem and through the leaves, through the plant leaf into the atmosphere where it becomes a gas is called, that whole process is called transpiration a transference of H2O molecules from a liquid state in the soil to a gas state in the atmosphere. A xylem cell wall in the plants that you're growing, let's say it's corn. Uh, the, the xylem is a central part of the stem of the corn plant. Adhesive forces, the H2O molecules attaching to the walls of the xylem. The cohesive force is the attachment and the connectivity and the attraction between the molecules. It is a force, an electromagnetic force. The xylem cell, this is an illustration of it. Another form, there, there are really two forms of water loss in a farmer's field. One is transpiration that we've just discussed, which in this case, we're looking at the corn plant and it's the movement of the water from the soil out into the atmosphere where it becomes a gas. Evaporation is the loss of soil water through directly at the soil surface into the atmosphere where it's converted from a liquid form to a gas form. How do we control this? 
In this illustration, we're looking at the use of a cover crop planted with corn. Corn has been harvested. Uh, and in this case, you can imagine the evaporation at the soil surface in this part of the field is much faster. The movement of water from a liquid state in the soil to a gas state above the soil, evaporation is much faster on this side compared to this side, where the cover crop is reducing the loss of water from the soil in the form of evaporation. Obviously, there's still transpiration, but the agronomic evidence in agriculture strongly favors using cover crops to protect against the loss of soil moisture. There are many other benefits to cover crops in agronomy, but this is one of them, is it helps hold moisture in the soil. Reduces the need for rainfall. It reduces, reduces then the need for irrigation. Another way to reduce the transpiration of water from the soil through the plant into the atmosphere as a gas is by shade. In this case, we're looking at a shade cloth over a greenhouse, which will reduce transpiration forces in the plant. Another important management consideration in farming uh, as relates to viscosity is the use of motor oils on farms. Engine oil viscosity refers to how easily oil pours at a specified temperature. Thin oils have lower viscosity and pour more easily at low temperatures than thicker oils that have a higher viscosity. Thin oils reduce friction in engines and help engines start quickly during cold weather. Where I live in the United States, in the state of Iowa, uh, about six months out of every year, we have cold weather. And so in all of our tractors on our farms here, we're forced to use a thinner quality of oil compared to the tractors that you would find on the equator areas, tropical areas of our planet. There are many, many forms of equipment utilized in agriculture, which require lubrication. Lubrication is primarily based on some form of an oil. The oils may come from hydrocarbons from the ground, petroleum oils, or they may also be of botanical sources like castor oil. Castor oil comes from the castor bean. Castor oil is a very thin oil, or it is an oil actually that has properties as, and it is an excellent lubricant. It's used, for example, in jet engines to lubricate a jet engine. It's also utilized in sewing machines as a lubricant for a sewing machine in industries that use commercial grade sewing machines. As you can imagine, inside the, the internal workings of a transmission or an engine or the hydraulic system in a tractor, uh, many other types of equipment, there are many moving parts and they must be lubricated. Oils come with varying degrees of viscosity and they are indicated by uh, code numbers. Here is a 0W30 oil, 0 being very low vis being a very low viscosity oil. On the other end, 20W50. This is a measurement or a coding for oil that is of high viscosity, and you can see the difference in how they pour. Viscosity grade and outdoor temperature. This is interesting. With this particular type of oil here, 0W30, all of these oils, as you can see, are tolerant of heat and lubricate well, even in the presence of heat, 
In this case, we're looking at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. On the other hand, not all of these oils perform well at low temperatures. So for a 20W50, the limit in terms of low temperature is around zero degrees Fahrenheit, whereas a 0W30 will, take, will still perform well as a lubricant all the way down to minus 30. So on this level, at the lower level here, we have uh, low viscosity. On the top, high viscosity. Note this particular lubricant, which is going into the, uh, the rear axle of a vehicle. Uh, and in this case, this note the measurement here, the, the grade of this lubricant is 80W90. This is a very dense, high viscous lubricant that is used in the differential or the rear end uh, uh, gear system that drives the wheels on the rear axle. That's a, we always use in this particular part of, the, uh, of a machine, we always use a, a very viscous lubricant, in this case, ADW90. <clears throat> I'm now going to play a short video clip, uh, which talks about oil and viscosity. The most important physical property of a lubricant is viscosity. And viscosity is an oil's resistance to flow and shear. And a simple way that you can think about this is how thick or how thin a fluid is. We, we typically refer to a fluid by its viscosity. If you've ever used the vernacular a 220 oil, you're, that 220 is actually the viscosity of the fluid. And you can think about this as if you've ever tried to pour something out of a, a container. Something that has a high viscosity is very thick and flows very slowly. Something that is a low viscosity moves very quickly, like water. It pours out very easily. And there are many things that influence viscosity. Uh, the temperature at which it's operating influences it. The higher the temperature, the lower the viscosity. The lubricant thins out. Water can increase or decrease viscosity based upon how the interaction is with the base oil and what state it is in, whether it's emulsified or dissolved. Different contaminants will change viscosity as well. Same thing with the pressure and the shearing of base oil. So the entire time that lubricant is in service, there could be fluctuations in viscosity and it has to be monitored. Like we said, this is the most important property of a lubricant. This is an excerpt from Noria's Lubrication Basics online training course, which covers topics like... Okay, now we're going to make a few comments about surfactants in agriculture. Surfactants come for many purposes. Uh, stickers, spreaders, penetrants, wetting agents, cleaning agents. These are all examples of the applied value of the chemistry of a surfactant. This is an example of a, of a spreader. You might also consider it a sticker. Sticker and spreaders have, uh, are very closely related to each other from a chemical point of view. In this case, you see the water droplet without a surfactant blended into the water. As we've illustrated before, in this case, the, the, the relationship between water, a polar molecule, and the waxy surface of the leaf, that waxy material being nonpolar, they don't interact well together. And as a result, the water will beat up on the surface of the leaf. Whereas when you add a surfactant, it breaks the tension between the nonpolar and the polar molecules. And it allows the water, the liquid material, to more easily spread on the surface of the leaf. So if you are applying a, a foliar fertilizer to a leaf, uh, you would prefer that the distribution of that material be more uniformly distributed throughout the surface of the leaf. Therefore, you might use a adjuvant or a surfactant which breaks the tension 
between polar and nonpolar molecules compared to this side of the leaf without the surfactant where you have eating up the distribution of your foliar feed, the plant food that's in the water would be poorly distributed. The plant would not take up the nutrient so well. With the surfactant, you get more uniform uptake of the nutrient in a foliar feed. Now looking at an example of adding SLS, this is sodium lauryl sulfate. This is a type of, of a surfactant or a soap, you might call it. Okay, in this case, uh, we're looking at oil here in this part of the illustration. Oil and water do not mix. Oil sits on the top of the water. They, a, pol a nonpolar and a polar liquid in contact with each other and they do not mix. When you add SLS, sodium lauryl sulfate, these are the molecules of sodium lauryl sulfate. They then create a connection. One side of the molecule will connect to the oil, the other side to the water. What you get ultimately is SL allows the formation of mycelium, meaning the oil is dissolved in the water. The oil will not float in the water. So the particulates of oil, when they are surrounded by this uh, surfactant, uh, then, then the tension between the oil and the water uh, is reduced and the oil is allowed then to be mixed in with the water. And it could be thought as a, now a solution. There are different types of, of surfactants, anionic, cationic, amphoteric, non-ionic. Non These are just different types of, of surfactants. And surfactant examples, common soap, we're all familiar with that one. Sodium lauryl sulfate, very common all over the planet, used commercially, and is often found in shampoos. Sodium lauryl sulfate can come from either synthetic manufacturing, or it can also be extracted from botanical sources. Saponins. Saponins are a type of surfactant chemistry, which are taken from botanical sources. EI plant, for example, in South America, uh, contains naturally large amounts of saponin chemistry. So KI extracts contain saponins. Also the yucca plant, very common to Mexico and many parts of the world. Uh, the yucca plant contains saponins and can be extracted. So yucca extracts contain saponins, which are surfactants. And there is a very large number today in the industrial agricultural world and the industrial chemical world, a large number of synthetic surfactants. So we want to thank you for watching this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to check here um, in the chat. All right, there are a few questions. We see that Azerbaijan is here again today. Hello, Azerbaijan. Okay. Uh, what is the relationship between viscosity with organic matter? If you have a liquid, let's say water, and you dissolve into the liquid, or you place into the liquid, the chemistries of organic matter, which are carbon-based chemistries, you will increase the viscosity of that liquid. If you have a soil which is very high in organic matter. There are two types of soil in the world. There are mineral soils as well as organic soils. 
organic soils will have a very high percent of organic matter. They are not very common in the world, but they are dis a distinct type of soil. Uh, you can have 60, 70, 80% organic matter in a uh, organic soil. Mineral soils will typically have less than 10% organic matter. So let's say that you have a mineral soil with a high amount of organic matter in it, 5%. And the question here is, will viscosity increase or decrease? Well, soil itself is not a liquid, okay? But the water in the soil, the liquid in the soil, if you have high organic matter soil, then you would, to the extent that the organic matter was soluble in the water, the solutes will, as they are dissolved in the water, absorbed in the water, they're picked up by the water, they're transported by the water, that transport process, when it has a high degree of organic chemistries that have been absorbed by the water, you will tend to see that the soil water at that point will have more viscosity compared to water without those dissolved chemistry. So how does wind affect evaporation at the surface of a leaf? Wind is increasing evaporation at the surface of the leaf simply through movement. So the, the gas molecules that are in the atmosphere, wind causes them to move quickly and the wind creates a force and that force is like a suction. So you have one thing, which is simply the movement of, of H2O molecules through the leaf surface out into the gas where you have the, the more dense population of water molecules in the liquid within the leaf, which automatically and naturally moves into the atmosphere <clears throat> where the density of water molecules is a lot less. Wind is a force which actually then decreases to a certain extent the density of the H2O molecules in the atmosphere, as such, it increases the evaporative forces at the surface of the leaf. <clears throat> it actually then would accelerate the movement of the H2O molecules, which are more concentrated and are occurring with greater density within the liquid form of water in the side of the leaf, it would then move faster out into the less dense population of H2O molecules in the atmosphere. Okay, so I think we'll stop there today and we'll look forward to our next session, which will be next Friday. And Kelly will be sending out the, uh, the PowerPoints and, and we'll send the uh, recordings. Everything will be posted on YouTube and she will inform everybody about the next session, which is coming on Friday. Thank you very much. Goodbye.